Rescate. Rescate. If you look this up, or if you enter it into Google Translate, what you get is rescue, redemption, uh, ransom. And actually, that is the meaning that this word had in the earliest Iberian dictionaries, to get back something that your enemy has taken from you, to ransom. But if we go back 500 years to the history of colonial Brazil, resgate has, in that context, become shorthand for something that's pretty much the exact opposite of rescuing, slaving. So my research project at the JCB is kind of looking at how one term can travel so far. Or asked differently, my research question would be, what could possibly be redemptive about slavery? So in my brief minutes, I'm going to speed walk you through some historical context, three historical contexts. We can think of them as has got you one, has got you two, has got you three, in which this term accreted, drew to itself uh, new meaning and, and really um, became layered with meaning. And fascinatingly, these meanings don't necessarily go away over time, but new ones can be added on top. So has got to one. Let's talk first about the medieval Mediterranean. And this is a context uh, in which things like the Crusades are going on. There's warfare between Christians and Muslims. It's raging for a long time uh, in Iberia and elsewhere in the Mediterranean world over centuries. And by the high Middle Ages, what is kind of crystallized out of these conflicts is buyback arrangements whereby you can ransom your fellow Muslim from the Christian enemy who's taken him or her prisoner, or you can ransom your fellow Christian from the Muslim enemy who's taken him or her uh, captive. And so these buyback arrangements, uh, we know a lot more about from the Christian perspective because uh, of our sources and the recent uh, huge surge and terrific new research uh, than we do about these things from the Muslim side, but it's going on back and forth across the Mediterranean. Muslims and Christians are engaged, and this is what's called hezgate, rescate. But as uh, Southern European merchants start moving out from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic and far beyond, we start to see another meaning come to the fore. Chesgachi too, we'll call it. And this is chesgachi as trade, or actually more specifically barter. It's probably conducted with a lot of pointing as people sort of improvise exchange on the fly, sort of pure exchange. Um, and this is what you see actually in Columbus's diary of his first voyage when he talks about uh, rescatar, resgatar, um, it's, it's, uh, it's barter that he's talking about. So I want to take you quickly to one of the earliest moments of Portuguese expansion along the West African coast that many of you who work on comparative slavery know well, and that is in the 1440s. In 1441, uh, the chronicler Zurada, the Portuguese chronicler, tells us that Portuguese go ashore, nab people, bring them on a boat, and they are Moors. They bring Moors onto the boat, and they're going to take them back captive to Portugal. And they realize that their Arabic translator that they, can, uh, that they brought along can understand one of these, a man that Zurada tells us is named Adahu, who seemed nobler and more, uh, better educated and had seen more of the world than the others. When this man is in Portugal, he convinces his captors to ransom him. He probably knew about these Mediterranean arrangements I was just talking about, about Hezgate I. He convinces him, uh, them to take him back to the West African coast, which they do, uh, and they put him on shore, and he promptly disappears. And Zurara is kind of comically, to, uh, or bizarrely to our mind, uh, incensed by this. He talks about how deceitful this man is for just running away. He was supposed to bring traitors to ransom him, and he, he, he he went back on his word, deceitful person. So they have brought also two other youths that they considered uh, were among the more noble people from these people that they'd captured along the African coast. They bring them back, and they do succeed in ransoming them for 10 other people, some gold dust and some ostrich eggs. And these things are taken back to Portugal, and Henry the Navigator is delighted because these 10 people, who are called by Zurara negros, these black people are 
now going to be uh, in some subjection, because they are, after all, captives. They're slaves. But their souls will have the opportunity to be saved, and that's what matters. So now we have rescate as trade that may involve trade in people. And you see something going on that is akin to what happens in the Mediterranean. After all, ransom is a kind of exchange. Merchants may be the intermediaries for Hezgate I, but Hezgate II is happening uh, in a different way, and things are getting stretched out of shape. And here we have something that is involving a third term that's neither Christian nor Muslim, but simply categorized as black, people who are already commodities, and they are being brought into this, and we're told it's good for them. So now let's move uh, into, uh, by the way, this has got the two keeps going as well. This is something that's not uh, going to disappear as new meaning is accreted. Let's go quickly to, how much time do we have now? All right, good. Uh, let's go quickly now to Brazil and the context of colonial Brazil, where, frankly, for the first half century or so after Cabral uh, makes landfall in 1500. Uh, the Portuguese are kind of distracted by India and don't really care a whole lot about what they are doing in Brazil. But by the middle of the century, well, we know about the early going from the sparse sources that do survive, that uh, people are very, of course, interested in Brazil wood, which is how Brazil gets its name, from the Pau Brasil, the Brazil wood that's a dye stuff that they can take load on the ship and take back to Europe. We also know that there's slave raiding going on, although we have precious few sources to give us insight into this. Uh, by the middle of the century, however, there's change that must have felt dizzying to the people who were living it. Um, there's a new polity being set up in Brazil. A new governor is sent out around mid-century. Jesuits come. Missionary activity is starting to gear up. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a, a colony being set up. Sugar mills, of course, are being set up. Uh, labor is needed for these things. And in this context, uh, and let's add another ingredient that has to do with the John Carter Brown Library. In this context, there's also a tremendous upsurge in the second half of the century, from the 1550s on, in accounts of uh, people who were sometimes themselves taken captive, uh, but about Brazilians' cannibalism. Uh, the best known of these uh, is, is, is probably Hans Staden, but there's lots of accounts. Teve, uh, Jean de Levy, and others are writing about uh, Brazilians as cannibals, as man-eaters, as captive takers who, who love the taste of human flesh. And so all of this is swirling around. And in the second half of the 16th century, there's a kind of new resgate, I think. Uh, I'm thinking about this now, so I'd love to hear your suggestions. Resgate three in this context is um, a kind of, if you will, uh, dual action resgate uh, because it's not good, and the Jesuits and the Crown and everybody can agree on this, it's not good to go out into the woods and just randomly, wantonly enslave uh, indigenous Brazilians, but these are people who are already uh, at war with each other. They're terribly vindictive, bloodthirsty, bellicose, and they are constantly enslaving and eating each other. And so if you intervene in warfare uh, and take uh, people who are already captive and buy them and acquire them as your slaves, uh, then you're doing them a double favor. Because not only will their souls be saved, and here we see the logic of Hezgate II uh, and one, born into Hezgate III, but their bodies will be saved from being eaten. So doubly efficacious, doubly good. We're kind of back full circle to rescue. Rescue never entirely went away, did it? So this is what I'm thinking about these days. And I think if we want to understand the past as a place, as I'm always telling my students, that's not populated by mustachio twirling villains who are out to do each other harm, or heroes who are perfect and, uh, and uh, uh, if, if we're out to understand motivations behind things, to our minds now, as atrocious as slavery, we have to appreciate uh, the terms in which they thought about them. And I think keywords are a good way, and in fact, that's what this is an exercise in. Uh, uh, keywords are a good way to avoid 
falling into anachronism to try and get our minds around what's really going on in the past uh, and do it justice without caricaturizing the people who participated. So thank you very much for your attention.